Hi, everyone. Please take a seat. Our session is uh, starting right now. Um, my name is Kwan Su. Uh, I'm responsible for KK Fund. I'm based in Singapore. We're a seed stage uh, VC in uh, investing in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Um, but today, these two are the stars of the panel. We have uh, Helen from uh, Chiming Ventures. We also have uh, Harry from Clearview Ventures here to share with us about uh, you know, their views, uh, also share a little bit about uh, their investments in the media and, and entertainment sector. Um, so maybe first off, uh, you know, Helen and Harry, if you could uh, share with us a little bit about your view, because media entertainment is a fairly big sector. What are some of the more interesting subsectors within this overall you know, media and entertainment space that uh, you guys are more keen in looking at uh, these days? So maybe I can start with you, uh, Helen, yeah, if sure. you can share that with us. Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, the media entertainment space is um, entering a very interesting phase. Um, you know, when I started, uh, 10 years ago, looking at this, uh, this space in China, uh, I made an investment in Tudou because at that time, I think that uh, the need for a platform, especially for the internet generation, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, was very strong. And uh, Tudou, of course, grew to be very, very big and uh, you know, merged with Youku. Um, so, but I think now is uh, actually more a time where the platforms are competing for good content. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Teaming has been looking at uh, some of these uh, very, what do you call, head uh, content players. Uh, and recently, uh, last year, we made an investment in uh, Luoti Siwei. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, he is an online celebrity, uh, kind of like Oprah. And he has <laughs> about uh, 7 million um, users on WeChat and also has a video program on Youku, uh, which is uh, also widely followed. Uh, so that I think his, um, his special uh, focus is on this knowledge-based uh, content. It talks about uh, politics, about uh, economics, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, even history. <coughs> and uh, you know, it's interesting that his uh, audience actually spans uh, quite a wide range of uh, age groups. So uh, we think that uh, maybe it's because China is growing so quickly, and there's a lot of demand actually for uh, knowledge to help people keep up with uh, the changing times in China. So this is one that we've invested in, and uh, it's growing very nicely. Great, thank you, Helen. Harry, uh, um, you know, Helen talked about uh, content, unique content. Um, how about in other fields within media, uh, whether it's distribution or any, any other uh, parts of that? So, uh, so Clearview Partners, we're a uh, sector-focused, consumer-focused fund uh, looking after growth stage equity uh, in China. And so we think a lot about the consumption sector in terms of food and beverage, lifestyle, consumer technology. And a big part of that is really thinking about how consumers spend their money. So we think a lot about share of wallet. And um, if you were to take out the mortgage payment and the rental expenses of a typical Chinese consumer today, the entertainment share of, its share of wallet is about 9%. This is about half of what they spend in Korea. So, and it's about 80% of what they spend in the US. Now, the growth in this category and this share of wallet is expected to be tremendous. This is why there's so much euphoria, excitement, and even the topic of today's panel. Uh, and by 2025, it's expected that this 9% is gonna grow to about 16, 16.5%. That is off of a very, very large base today of about 64 trillion renminbi. Mm -hmm. So I think this is where all the excitement is going. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uh, entertainment ex uh, uh, ex uh, investing, I think that um, China represents a tremendous amount of opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was at Universal Music and uh, MTV, uh, we were also investors into PPTV, ABA that went public in Hong Kong, digital media music companies, ringback tone companies, and so forth. So we've really seen an evolution and a transformation in the media landscape in China in a way that's completely, completely mm -hmm. unimaginable. Uh, I guess it was about 15 years ago, I was with mm -hmm. Governor Schwarzenegger. We went to lobby Guangdian uh, <laughs> um, uh, SARF to try to get them to liberalize the quota of movies, foreign mm -hmm. movies coming into China. At that time, there was only 20. And today, China is the second largest box office in the world. Mm -hmm. So, so much has changed and there's so many opportunities ahead. 
Right, thanks, uh, Harry. Um, you know, mentioned that definitely in terms of the landscape in China, a lot has changed. And I think uh, backstage, uh, you know, Helen and I were uh, chatting about uh, when she first invested in Tudou. This was back in 2006. Um, so would love to hear the story about, <laughs> you know, how did you, you know, come across the team? What did you see in Tudou back then? And also, I think similar to what Harry had commented, you know, how has the landscape changed since then until now? Mm, sure. Um, when we saw Tudou um, in 2005, late 2005 and invested in 2006, um, I think that at that time, uh, we were looking at the whole Web 2.0 wave mm -hmm. and, you know, the whole blogging wave where um, a lot of users wanted to be able to express themselves. And so we felt that that was a very interesting trend. And the use of video uh, mm -hmm. was also exploding, like you could see in, uh, in the US with the YouTube uh, explosion. So, um, so we thought, yeah, Tudor was, a, uh, the team was strong and we wanted to back the trend. So we made an investment. Um, I think that at that time, you know, I would say that the, it, there was some user-generated content, but it was still very, very a uh, small number of mm -hmm. users that were able to create this content. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, the fact that you needed, uh, you know, video editing tools, you needed um, sort of, like, you know, video cameras, and that was it. Was the barrier was higher? Mm -hmm. So we found that actually what happened was a lot of the content that was being watched tend not to be like the drama series that you know we had to buy from Korea or Hong Kong. Uh, but I think today the, the <coughs> UGC, the user-generated content has really uh, become more sophisticated and uh, because there's a lot better video editing tools, there's a mm -hmm. lot, you know, um, you can just film with your iPhone even like and get pretty good quality. And so, you know, like a recent trend we saw is this uh, live streaming uh, where, you know, anybody can become, uh, can have their 15 mm -hmm. minutes of fame, right? And uh, really just, you know, record your life. And I think that's also an interesting trend because young people uh, that we see, like especially the 90s generation, uh, they like to, uh, they call it live in the moment, right? <laughs> they like to see something that is, uh, actually they don't mind if it's raw, uh, but you know, right, <coughs> as opposed to like just professionally created mm -hmm, content mm -hmm. uh, because they think that, that the reality aspect of it uh, attracts them. So I think that's a very interesting thing that we you know, see evolving. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that was about the same time yeah. um, <laughs> we invested into PPTV. Right, sure. We were yeah. early investor into PPTV, and, um, and I remember having a conversation with the founder. Bill Yao was a graduate student from Wuhan University. Mm -hmm. I met him, he was a typical internet guy. Mm -hmm. And then I said, how'd you come up with this idea? He said, well, you know, it was Friday night, I had no money, no girlfriend, I had nothing to do, and I loved the NBA. So he wrote a program to stream the NBA basketball on his computer. And then a year or two later, mm -hmm. there was like 80 million people using this thing. And it be had become really, really interesting. And so that's when we backed him. It was a very different, mm -hmm management profile than your experience to uh, your company. But then uh, last year, a couple of years ago, it was sold. Um, and, uh, and so he's a very, very different uh, mm -hmm. tech guy today. You know? mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, and also, I'd like to follow up, uh, Harry. You know, given your experience and background as actually an operator in the media industry previously, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a very unique perspective when it comes to, for example, curated content versus, you know, the raw UGC that Helen has uh, uh, shared. You know, how do you see these two develop going forward? Do you see the UGC, for example, the rise of uh, 17 from uh, Taiwan uh, or Arsenic, uh, you know, that being the, uh, the hot app everyone's talking about in the US right now, or even Snapchat. Uh, how do you see the balance of these two develop, especially given the China context? So I guess uh, I said this in a previous panel earlier, um, it used to be that there was the trinity of uh, creativity. It used to be that Hollywood looked to Silicon Valley for the latest technology. Then Silicon Valley looked to Wall Street for funding, and Wall Street looked to Hollywood for the coolest content and hang out with the stars. <laughs> so that was the easy model where that was the perfect trifecta in how creation was, was done. I think with new technology and how the businesses have been disrupted, I think uh, that triangle has become a bit like a, a pentagon. Mm -hmm. I think you now have the factor of consumers, it's direct share of voice, mm -hmm. and the fact that they can now have their own community and one voice can now be amplified into a much broader stage, they've become a very, very important piece of the creative process, and that's led to UGC content, mm -hmm. which has also led to a number of stars that have become 
really, really big, not only in China with Wang Hong, mm -hmm. and also international celebrities have been signed. And I think the fifth part of the Pentagon that I think uh, we would see now is, um, is of course funding and capital, mm -hmm. which is why we're in the business that we are. <laughs> and so, um, so this Pentagon of creativity is, uh, in my opinion, is only, only the next phase of evolution. Mm -hmm. The world's just getting so much more disrupted Right. It's happening so, the changes are so much faster mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be surprised if eventually this Pentagon becomes just like a circle with so many different stakeholders that can drive this process mm -hmm. and create a lot of value for everybody. Great. So we talked about the uh, importance of content, uh, content. Uh, you know, either it's curated or it's from uh, UGC. Maybe we can shift a little bit and talk about the technology side of things. For example, everyone seems to be going crazy about uh, virtual reality, augmented reality these days. How do you see that impact the media and entertainment sector, uh, you know, uh, in, for example, even uh, given your own investments? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, we've been looking a little bit at virtual reality, um, mm -hmm. especially I think with regards to uh, gaming and uh, some live broadcasting, uh, we think these areas probably would take off first. And then probably movies, um, drama series would be later because mm -hmm. uh, it's actually quite difficult to, right. uh, to make a story because the whole storytelling process needs to be changed. Like how do you uh, make sure that the audience is looking at the, the right direction? And you know, <laughs> you, you used to be like director controlled, but now the user can just watch anything, right? They, they, they can just um, mm -hmm. choose to uh, look in other directions. So I think that the, the movie making uh, part will probably come later. Um, but then the other challenge for, as an investor is, you know, how do you invest in this trend? Because uh, we think that as the, the barriers to entry are not so high for content um, side. Uh, so the big companies, the big gaming companies, the big um, you know, movie companies will also come in. Um, so, and then the, the core like hardware um, side is probably the players are you know, also the giants um, like Facebook, or there are you know, some startups um, probably stronger in the Silicon Valley than in China. Mm -hmm. So this is an area that we, we think is the future, but we haven't really found the right uh, you know, way to, to invest. Yeah. Okay. I, I think virtual reality is going to be definitely the next big wave of technology experience that the consumers are going to really be able to enjoy and benefit from. And then AR, of course, is even a, a, a different step level uh, forward. Of the companies that we've seen in the VR and AR space, um, I think the question for us as an investor is, at what point do you jump in and uh, take that sort of risk? and? <clears throat> You know, there's always the old saying, are you leading edge or are you bleeding edge, mm -hmm. right? So if you're bleeding edge, you're really the first mover, but you're spending a lot of money and you're hoping the corner comes around a little bit faster. Um, uh, so, you know, the venture guys will likely <laughs> probably place a lot more bets. Uh, we're growth guys, so we'll probably wait and, uh, until you guys monetize a few <laughs> companies that are successful before we take on uh, that type of opportunity. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as the genre is concerned, there's no question virtual reality is going to really bring uh, to life a whole different set of experience. In my conversation recently with HTC and uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing, the, the challenge for them is that um, they're trying to seed content production to fuel the technology adoption, right? It's only $1,000 to buy a, a VR headset or a system to fit out a room and give you a complete experience. Mm -hmm. But without the content to follow, it really is just hardware and that's gonna be obsolete pretty fast. Um, so the challenge will be, will the hit lead with mm -hmm. the content and the creativity lead this value creation <coughs> process? Uh, then of course, it's genre. Uh, apart from the obvious application where, you know, it's a four letter word, starts with the letter P, <laughs> apart from that genre, which is going to be huge, like most things online, uh, I think the other genres are going to be things like sports, uh, religion, um, et cetera. So I think uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the future looks pretty bright on this, but then as an investor, the question is, when are you going to take that bet? Right. And I think, uh, you know, you guys, both of you touched on the, uh, you know, from the perspective of an investor. And also, I think, uh, you know, the common discussion right now, not just in China, but I think, uh, you know, in other parts of Asia and even in the U.S. right now, is this, uh, this so-called, uh, you know, winter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are some of these special, and I think when it comes to media entertainment business, which sometimes may take a longer uh, time frame, for you to start seeing the unit economics work and the scale and so on and so forth. What advice are you giving to your portfolio companies for them to get through this period and hopefully continue to grow uh, down the road? 
Well, well, it's actually very interesting because um, some of the content players, a lot of them that I'm looking at are profitable. I like um, internet companies, like I pure internet companies. They're burning a lot of cash and trying to right. build a platform and attract users. A lot of these content guys are actually um, have their content on platforms that are already built. Mm -hmm. So for example, they're leveraging on WeChat, they're leveraging mm -hmm. on uh, Yuku or even uh, Weibo. Mm -hmm. So um, their they're, you know, user acquisition cost is low mm -hmm. and good content naturally attracts users, right? right. So I think that is um, a g advantage of mm -hmm. uh, content companies that they are actually can be very profitable. Um, but I think the challenge is content companies, how can they become big? Mm -hmm. Like everybody dreams of right. being the next um, you know, Marvel or Disney, but how many make it, right? <laughs> So I think our um, advice to like content companies, like for example, Lozi Sue is, mm -hmm. uh, can you be uh, more of a platform as well, right? Mm -hmm. So can you, as a, we call it Da V, can right. you um, create other small Xiao V <laughs> and you know, make them big as well? Right. So like an like a MCN in the US, so that's what we, we look at, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I guess, um, <laughs> uh, I, I guess the content business is really a hits driven business, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was at Universal Music, we used to sign 100 acts a year, and we would pray for the one or two, Zhang Xueyou, uh, uh, or Chen Yixing, or Rain to come along mm -hmm. and pay back the others. Uh, I think um, if my, my only thought on the content side is that if you're going to be in that business, you need to be figuring out a way to make sure that you can have an ecosystem or a mechanism so that you can mm -hmm. systematically try to raise your risk, uh, uh, raise your success ratio a little bit mm -hmm. more. So whether that's leveraging analytics of big data, whether it's using deep learning machinery that could predict what consumer preferences are, I think those are the things that are gonna enable you to be a little bit more successful <clears throat> and maybe attract capital a little bit easier, but otherwise it really is a very, very low mm -hmm. success ratio and it's a high risk, high reward business. Right. Um, Thank you, and uh, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for today. So for those of you who are uh, uh, startups uh, working on this field, you've heard from two expert investors uh, and some of their suggestions and advice on how to uh, continue to grow and scale your companies. So thank you so much again. Please uh, give a hands up for Helen and for Harry. Thank, thank you, you both. Thank you.